it's time to understand now why it is so important to make a distinction within the polyunsaturated fatty acids between the omega-6 and the omega-3 families. Although their structural functions, which we already discussed, are very similar, their regulatory role as precursors of the eicosanoids is very different. Remember that the eicosanoids are important hormone-like substances that orchestrate many vital metabolic processes at the cardiovascular, immune, and nervous system level. The main classes of eicosanoids are prostaglandins, prostacyclins, thromboxanes, and leukotrienes. We can build all these molecules, both from omega-6 and from omega-3 fatty acids, and these molecules will affect the same areas of metabolism, but in different ways. Every cell in our body makes eicosanoids. Their complex biochemistry is often challenging to understand, because for every molecule in this group that does something, there is another that does the exact opposite. To complicate things even more, both molecules are potentially useful, but both are potentially dangerous. I know it sounds like the riddle of the Sphinx, but let me make a couple of examples to clarify what I mean. There are some eicosanoids, called thromboxanes, that promote platelet aggregation and blood clotting, and then there are others, called prostacyclines, that instead inhibit platelet aggregation and promote blood fluidity. Which is the good and which is the bad? If we consider that formation of clots in the bloodstream can sometimes trigger a heart attack, the eicosanoids that inhibit clotting could be considered the good guys, since they keep our blood fluid. But on the other hand, even a little cut on our finger would cause us to bleed to death if it wasn't for the eicosanoids that promote platelet aggregation and clotting to close the wound. Prostacyclines also promote vasodilation in our arteries, while thromboxanes, guess what, promote vasoconstriction. Excessive vasoconstriction causes high blood pressure and cardiovascular risk, but on the other hand, excessive vasodilation would cause a dangerous blood pressure drop to the point of fainting. Some eicosanoids promote immune function, some other depress it. Well, you may think this one's easy. The good ones are those that promote immunity to help us fight viruses, bacteria, and cancer cells. Well, it depends. If it wasn't for their counterparts that slow down this immune defense drive, these could go overboard, resulting in autoimmune disease in which our overstimulated immune system starts attacking the healthy cells of our own body. Some eicosanoids have pro-inflammatory activity, and needless to say, some others are anti-inflammatory. Inflammation is definitely something we'd prefer to live without. It causes us pain, fever, and production of free radicals that damage our tissues and accelerate the aging process and risk for chronic disease. However, when it comes to fighting pathogens that attack our body, it is precisely the inflammatory response what we need to get rid of these enemies as soon as possible. Some eicosanoids promote pain transmission, others suppress it. Nobody likes to suffer, and the reason we take aspirin when our head aches is precisely to block the production of these pain-promoting eicosanoids. But on the other hand, pain is a life-saving mechanism that enables us to realize that something's going wrong, so that we can take the necessary action. If we touch a very hot surface, we immediately remove our hand to avoid a serious burn. If we feel a strong pain in our chest, we can run to the hospital and save us from a heart attack. As you probably know, those individuals that for a genetic defect cannot feel any pain usually die within their first years of life. Some eicosanoids promote cell proliferation, some other inhibit it. Controlled cell proliferation is necessary so that our body can grow, develop, and repair damaged tissues. But if cell proliferations hadn't a check, the risk for tumor development and growth would be much higher. I think you got the idea. Now, these opposite actions are often performed by omega-6 derived eicosanoids and omega-3 derived ones. The way I picture this is sort of a pulling rope game, with the omega-3 team at one end of the rope and the omega-6 team at the other. The omega-6 team pulls toward inflammation, platelet aggregation, vasoconstriction, pain transmission, and strong immunity. The omega-3 team pulls toward anti-inflammation, blood fluidity, vasodilation, pain suppression, and immunosuppression.
We don't really want any of the two teams to win because any of their effects brought to the extreme would be bad. What we want instead is a balance between the two. We want a little bit of both and we should get both of them from diet in appropriate proportion. The ideal omega-3 to omega-6 ratio is between 1 to 2 and 1 to 4, meaning for every 2 to 4 grams of omega-6 in our diet, we want at least 1 gram of omega-3. Unfortunately, the average US diet is far from this ideal ratio, and we tend to have way too many omega-6 compared to the omega-3, promoting blood clotting, inflammation, and hypertension.